A great tower has been constructed. Its sinister existence has remained a secret until now. Its creator is an agent of evil known as... Resless. In the name of Bane, Dagtail will be mine. Go ahead. Take it from me. Bad games. In the modern era of freemium phone games, early access and itch.io, the scope of bad games has broadened considerably. Time was when a bad game was easy to spot. Terrible box art and an obscure developer were sure signs that the thing that you were about to beg your parents to rent for you was probably going to be shallow and boring at best, or downright broken at worst. But with the two biggest game engines being free to use, and an overwhelming amount of material and resources available online, pretty much everyone and their gran can make a video game now. This leads to a lot of crap to have to sift through as you try not to get duped by another dull anime waifu em up. And of course, now more than ever, we rely on the integrity of games journalism. Okay, never mind. Well, at least there's always the ever trustworthy Steam user reviews to guide us. A single fart sniffer can never truly encapsulate the highs and lows of a piece of media as well as thousands of people's individual experiences. Often I find the aggregate score on Steam pages to be more or less the opinion that I end up having about a game, maybe off by 5% in either direction. So after my Legacy of Cain series, I think something a little on the lighter side is in order. And with the YouTube algorithm being the insatiable maw that it is, what kind of filler content to make off the back of one of the best video game series of all time, then a clickbait-tastic look at the worst game that I currently own, as decided by the good people of the Steam review community. And how did I know that it was going to be a shitty tie-in for an existing IP? But before we begin, I want to first say a big thank you to all the new people who have subscribed. For those who are unaware, this video is part of a long-term project called the Steam Pilgrimage. The idea is to stop buying games and getting sucked in by key reselling websites and online sales, and finally play and finish every game in my Steam backlog, and of course then make videos and chat with you guys about it. If this is something that you want to tag along for, then maybe consider subscribing, and if you don't want that kind of commitment, but you like the video, a thumbs up or a share is always appreciated. You can also join the Discord server or use the hashtag Steam Pilgrimage on social media to share your experiences and start hacking away at that backlog. Sadly, we've no time for long explanations. Wait, what? To say that Dungeons & Dragons Daggerdale is a bad game is insulting. To bad games everywhere. A bad game can still be charming. Its faults can be humorous and some can even go on to achieve cult status giving late night streamers the jollies as they bungle their way through some endearing mess. Some games have hours of genuine love and attention poured into them and for one reason or another just don't turn out good due to lack of time or experience or any number of reasons. Daggerdale is another beast entirely. This game goes beyond bad to the point where I would call it offensive. And this is coming from a guy whose country took a racist stereotype, ran with it, not only turning it into a tourist attraction, but having the gall to call that attraction a museum. If Tommy Wiseau's The Room is the definition of a so bad it's good film, a bumbling mess of narrative nonsense and awful performances wrapped up in the charm of being one man's passion project, then D&D Daggerdale is Avatar The Last Airbender. The hollow, bastardized interpretation of a beloved fictional world with no lack of money or talent holding it back. Just a lack of any kind of consideration for the source material, or the medium, or the sanity of the consumer that you're going to subject to it. Because from a technical point of view, this game isn't terrible. All the buttons work and there's no real bugs or glitches that prevent you from playing the game. Even going through the terrible user reviews, there are some people who seem to enjoy it, but, you know... People like Coldplay and voted for the Nazis. But having played this game, I can confirm that it is one of the worst things that I've ever had to drag myself to the end of. And if you think that I'm being harsh, then lend me your ears, adventurer. As I tell you the tale of the worst rated game on the Steam Pilgrimage. Slow clap? Really? Kinda played out, dude. 
way back when I did my Grandia review, I said that I'd be judging games for what they are and not taking their age or possible development troubles into account, especially when it comes to older titles. My Steam library runs the gamut of games old and new, and a slight humble bundle addiction, which I'm still recovering from, certainly didn't help for a while. Well, I'm breaking that rule here because the devs decided to bring D&D into this, so not only will I be judging this as its own media, I'm also going to be judging it as an extension of the entire D&D range. Let's begin, shall we? My first disappointment came right as you press start. And I'm not even talking about the fact that the game refused to play any audio outside of the cutscenes for the first half of an hour. Upon choosing to undergo this ordeal, which I really wouldn't recommend, you're asked to pick between a dwarf cleric, a human fighter, an elf scout, and the halfling mage. You know how the best part of playing D&D is being given a set class and race combination with little to no input into who you are or what you look like? Well, the devs have got you covered. I decided to pick the Halfling, as their name is only an oar and an eye away from being horny Silent Tail, which is, you know, hilarious, but I didn't even change it because I was going to give this game a fair shake. In hindsight, my regret is immeasurable. The only reason that I can think for not allowing you to change at least your appearance is so that your character looks like their representation in the cinematics. After that momentous decision, you're pulled into a stat screen that actually kind of got my hopes up for a minute. All of the major stats are here, and wow, this actually looks kind of like a D&D character sheet. Except that you quickly learn that all of these, you know, these symbols, these like random symbols here that are supposed to represent, you know, numeric values. Yeah, they, they basically mean absolutely nothing. They also let you pick a feat at level 1, so I took Halfling Agility because it, it sounds kind of interesting. You have a class ability built in that forces your opponent to re-roll their attack dice every time they hit you and then take the second outcome. Now, in an actual D&D game, this would be an unbelievably game-breaking ability to have, which is why in the actual 4th edition D&D, this only triggers once per encounter. But the devs, they have that 400 IQ brain, so they anticipated this and compensated for it being so overpowered by just not having it work at all. I never once noticed an enemy attack animation that made contact with me, but didn't do damage. And there's plenty of little numbers that sprout out to show every time you hit them and how much damage you do, but I never once noticed a miss popping up. So, for the purposes of being, you know, ruthless and scathing, I'm just going to assume that this shit doesn't work. You also get a choice between Magic Missile and Fireball as a starting spell, which isn't even really a choice because, come on guys, we're all picking Fireball. In a regular RPG, having a pre-built character isn't always a bad thing, as you can usually go on to personalise them through their various skill trees and equipment and whatnot. But like I said, this isn't a regular RPG, this uses the D&D licence, so to not even allow you to customise basic things like your facial features and hairstyle is just an outright sin. Why not just make a generic RPG? Oh yeah, because then no one would play this without the D&D licence attached to it. Oh my god, we haven't, even gotten, <laughs> we haven't even gotten into the game yet. So the intro cinematic opens with the four main heroes being summoned by a lady named Lauren Aria. She gives us a very quick overview of the body, a Zentarum named Resless, and his location, the Tower of the Void. But who is this lady who just summoned us, and why are we so important? How are we supposed to stop this great evil? Well, don't worry. As Lauren herself says, Sadly, we've no time for long explanations. When you're making a D&D &D campaign, it's kind of a faux pas to announce to your level 1 players that they're some kind of chosen ones. As your players advance, it makes sense that deities and kings and whatnot might summon you for aid or there may be even be a prophecy told about them. But you don't do it at level 1 because it sucks the feeling of being an adventurer out of the game. Again, a perfectly acceptable plot device for a normal RPG, delivery notwithstanding. But for a game based off of any tabletop role-playing game, this is just embarrassing. Oh, and there's another reason that you don't do it, because it makes you feel like a total asshole when your prophesized hero dies to a lowly level 1 goblin. Okay, and the goblin rolls- oh, a natural 20, that's- that's everybody down then. Okay, good session guys, everybody's dead. But what about the prophecy? I thought we were supposed to like, save the entire world. Yeah, you probably shouldn't have fucked up so bad. Okay, anyway, let's sh shake it all off. Let's shake all that off. Let's say it's a rocky start. Let's go from here. So, we're in the game now, and this is again where it started to show some promise. The controls were actually kind of responsive, and the fighting felt a little bit weighty. I've played loot and slash games that had a far more floaty feel to them, and the fireball had a good splash effect. The problems, however, returned when I tried to use my special class ability. 
As a wizard, I can teleport out of the way to avoid getting my squishy mage arse surrounded and ganked by the endless hordes of enemies that swarm you in this game. The teleport would work sometimes, and sometimes it wouldn't work as intended, but it took me a while to figure out what the problem was. And then it clicked. The devs have very clearly made all of these abilities in some kind of a test environment with a flat surface to work on. But this game takes place in two locations, the Dwarven Mines and the Tower of the Void, neither of which happen to be a two-dimensional plane. So whenever you would teleport backwards on a ramp, your momentum would stop dead because the game thinks that the back of the ramp is a solid wall. So they plopped their horizontal teleport mechanic into their diagonal world, and now my character just... Hanlon's Razor states that you shouldn't attribute malice when stupidity is a more likely explanation. But Hanlon never had to play this lazy, soulless cash grab. You can upgrade your gear by either buying it at vendors or finding it as loot, but the benefits, both statistically and aesthetically, are negligible. The staff weapons ended up being the same asset with a different aura over it for whatever elemental type it was, and I found a handful of helmets in the game, none of which quite matched the armor that I happened to be wearing. The only memorable part of the gear was this glitch that made my character look like a pot-bellied Power Ranger ripoff. Again, it's impossible to discern what effect all of these stat boosts give you. In D&D, your armor class or magic defense determine whether an attack hits, but in regular RPGs, your armor tends to just reduce incoming damage. And since none of these numbers are actually explained, I'm going to assume that they're just there to give you the feeling that you're advancing. Like a nerdy little pat on the head, like, good boy, go get the quest objective, go get it. Speaking of quests, this game has a fuck ton of them and they're all the fucking same. Go here, kill X amount of Y and bring back Z. None of the NPCs in the game are voice acted and the main quests and side quests kind of just blend into one another after a while. <laughs> I've seen better reasons to go fetch stuff in free-to-play MMOs, and this wouldn't have been so egregious if it wasn't for the fact that you can only have one quest active at a time. This game forces you to take a quest, travel halfway across one of its three sandbox levels, complete the quest objective, and then travel all the way back to town before you can hand it in and get another quest. But then that side quest objective is going to be right beside the objective from the previous quest. The only reason I can think why this functions this way is that the devs were either too fucking lazy to implement a quest log system, or being able to do all of the quests at the same time would have halved the already embarrassing 6 hour playtime. Either way, I gave up trying to do the side quests halfway through and I still easily managed to reach the end, two levels lower than the cap of 9. Speaking of the end, let's just jump right to it because honestly nothing really happens in this game. The finale is a set-piece battle between Resless and you and the allies you've picked up along the way. These are comprised of two dwarfs that you help in the beginning, and a cleric named Nezra who you meet very close to the end of the game. Honestly, I can barely remember most of the rest of their names at this point, which made the set-piece deaths of each of them just comically cringe. I can imagine whoever came up with the idea of killing your allies during the final fight saw it as some epic piece of subversive storytelling. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. What? No! Not dwarf number two! Anyway, Resla summons a dragon because... Uh... And after a super gimmicky fight, Resla falls and the dragon goes to burn Daggerdale to the ground. Now, how do you think this game is going to end? See, this is the part where I'd put up a bunch of answers where the one that's true is also the most absurd one, but I'm gonna put about as much effort into this as the developers did and just tell you that it's a quick time event. They weren't arsed programming a fight with the dragon, so my Marvin the Martian lookalike pulls off some sweet PS2 era acrobatics, killing the dragon and falling to his death. No, I'm just kidding. You're actually saved by Lauren Aria, and the game is bookended by the second, count them, second cutscene in the entire game. She gathers your party together and congratulates you all on a job well done. Hooray! The evil is destroyed! But just as she's about to finish, Nezra, who I, I cannot stress enough was literally introduced like less than an hour before this, reveals herself to be Lauren's evil sister, stabs her, and then her goons rush the tower. She then mocks you asking if you're ready to fight and it's heavily implied that the entire party is wiped out by the invading force. I have no desire to kill you. 
But if you still plan on protecting your homeland, you will have to defeat every last one of us. I, I, I have, n I had no idea what they're going for here. It was, I was genuinely shocked as the credits started to roll. Maybe it was a setup for a DLC, or it was supposed to act as like a cliffhanger. But I'm, I'm just flabbergasted. You go through the tedium of this game, hacking and slashing through meat grinder enemies with at least the knowledge that you're saving the world, only to have an inconsequential character have you killed off fucking screen. Actually, you know what, as I'm saying this, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. This is the ultimate D&D game. It perfectly emulates the feeling of showing up to a session every week where the DM is totally winging it and has no plan for what's going on in the grand scheme. I mean, imagine turning around at the end of a campaign and telling your party, and then that NPC that you just met stabs Lauren, and it's like super unexpected, and your characters are all like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. And then the tower is overrun, and you all die. All right, good campaign, guys. Anyone want to go play some talisman or something? That's the kind of fucking thing that I would do, but I'm an idiot, and I wouldn't expect anybody to pay for it. Sorry, did I say that there were two cutscenes? I actually meant three. You see, after the credits roll, and I was done adding each and every name to my list, an after credits scene plays out. You see what looks like the top of the tower that you were just in peeking out of the ground as if it's been swallowed by sand. A robotic figure with a mechanical hand gripping a gun stands looking at the ruins as the camera pans out to reveal a signpost with the words Gamma Terra inscribed on it. That's right folks, this awful, boring, cringe-inducing excuse for an interactive storytelling device ends with a sneak preview at a Gamma World game which never got a release after the terrible sales performance of Daggerdale to no one's surprise. This is the equivalent of sitting next to someone on a train in a small compartment, just shitting your pants the entire way, and then at the end of the journey, reaching into your underwear and offering the fruits of your colon as a parting gift. Thank God I'm using this video to springboard into a slightly more poignant topic. I think at this point a lot of you are probably saying that, from the footage at least, the game doesn't look that bad. But the problem isn't really that the game is broken, apart from the odd glitch. The frustration comes from the cynical shallowness of the game. With everything feeling like just enough effort was put in to have a feature appear, but never really change or impact anything. Some games have gestalt-like properties where the individual systems aren't as comprehensive as they could be, but the way the devs have mixed each element together makes something greater than the sum of its parts. Like a finely blended scotch. This game is the opposite of that concept, a hastily thrown together cocktail that gets you drunk, I guess, but other than that, nothing about it is appealing. Each system is just passable, but the sum total of all the mediocrity at work drags the overall experience down further than any one concept could on its own. When pondering the reasons for the implementation of the more nonsensical decisions that the devs made, such as the obtuse quest journal system, the only explanation that I would come up with was often laziness. But the problem with laziness is that when you're demanding people pay for it, and you're kind of tricking them using an already established IP, laziness becomes malice. What's easier than making more fun and varied quests? not doing that and artificially increasing the length of the game. Should we test our features out to make sure they work in the actual game? No, they worked in the test environment. Should we write a story? Well, you know how that one plays out. We've no time. And it's this cookie cutter approach to designing the game that makes the affiliation to D&D so much more egregious. This game came out in 2011, just a few years before 5th edition would come along and tabletop RPGs would experience a kind of renaissance. The 4th edition was released in 2008 and wasn't very well received. Maybe the D&D brand was in such a bad place at the time that releasing something like this was worth the hit that the brand would take compared to the money they projected to make. It seems like they tried to make one part Diablo clone and one part Gauntlet style Endless Runner. But none of the work was put in to make the systems as robust as those two games. There is no new game plus to incentivize multiple playthroughs, and the minuscule range of gear that you can acquire doesn't come close to triggering the endorphins rush that Ludum of Games offer. 
And apart from the names of some of the factions, such as the Zentarum, nothing really ties this into the D&D IP anyway. The quote-unquote twist ending was so awful for a similar reason as I discussed back in my video on archetypes in storytelling. The game relies on the player knowing about classic fantasy tropes to set up the emotional weight rather than taking the time to develop the characters and plot. So the betrayal by the evil sister at the end of the game comes out of absolutely nowhere and feels empty and undeserved, but the plot point itself makes sense. It just hinges on you having experienced this cliche before. This allows the devs to do really lazy stuff like introducing this evil character right at the end and never giving even a hint of them being related to Lauren. It's a low resolution fantasy tale that values the plot points more than the structure and the sheer lack of any kind of care for how the story unfolds is just pathetic. The real draw of the game seems to be the 4 player co-op feature that you were able to play at launch but since then the servers have been shut down so that's off the table now. A lot of the negative reviews cite this removal of multiplayer features as the reason for now disliking the game. So could this be the reason for the game being so bad that it was simply intended to be played with friends? This is an argument that's brought up a lot and the series that springs to mind almost immediately is Borderlands. The lack of quest options and general emptiness of the world is often brushed over with the claim that the game is infinitely more fun with friends and designed as such. But you know what, Borderlands can actually be fun on your own, with the gunplay and the loot systems being good enough incentives to play through the games, although not the optimal way to play. The reason I don't accept this argument though is that anything is more fun with your friends. I would argue that having friends enhances Borderlands and takes some of the loneliness out of the often barren worlds. But the multiplayer isn't a crutch necessary for fun to be had, in fact I've played through every single Borderlands by myself because I don't have any friends. If the only enjoyment you can glean from a game is the fact that it lets you and your friends get together and focus on a shared task, then by all means enjoy yourself, but it doesn't make the game fun. It just means that the fun was really the friends that we made along the way. Which for me was zero. Tie-in games for popular IPs have a reputation of being kinda shit, usually rushed out to coincide with a product release like a movie. Some games based on IPs have been great though, allowing players to embody their favourite characters and explore the wondrous settings that they inhabit. In fact, D&D has a really good track record of releasing games that do the multiverse justice, from the amazing Baldur's Gate series to Neverwinter Nights, and even being the main influence for RPG masterpieces like Pillars of Eternity and Divinity Original Sin. The reason that these games worked as digital representations of the famous tabletop role-playing game is because they understood what it is gamers look for in those kinds of products. Options, choices, and a sense that you're affecting the story in some way. The decision to make a game in the D&D universe makes sense for those games not just because of the lore, but the style of game they wanted to make either emulates or complements the source material, attracting similar fans. If I had played this game with all of the names removed and you told me this was a Lord of the Rings game, a Warhammer game, or just a generic Tolkien-esque fantasy hack and slash, I probably would have believed any of those possibilities. But having the D&D license gave the devs leeway to not give a shit and let the name do a lot of the heavy lifting. The game honestly felt like more of a tech demo or a proof of concept, and every time I talked to an NPC or got a quest, it felt like it was a placeholder that would eventually be replaced by something more fleshed out. But this isn't the case, and as it stands, D&D Daggerdale is a lazy, thoughtless attempt at squeezing some money out of a built-in, dedicated, and often fervorous fanbase. It saddens me that at some point, one of the devs probably went to some gaming convention and used the fact that they worked on a studio-released D&D game to get someone into bed, only for that person to pick up the game and for it to be this. Part of the Steam Pilgrimage is contemplating how you get into this very common problem of having tons more games than you'll ever play, or at least finish. What incomprehensible number of infinitesimal actions had to occur for this piece of trash to end up in my Steam library? Actually, it was, it was probably a humble bundle. But even still, this is the reason for the Steam Pilgrimage, accountability for your purchasing decisions. There are so many games out there, especially on a platform like PC, where you basically have backwards compatibility for every game ever released on it. Coupled with the amount of sales and the option to torrent, we often find ourselves so overwhelmed with choice that we end up buckling under the weight of simply choosing a game to play. 
This means we'll neglect most of our games, maybe playing them once right after purchase before going back to an old favourite. This also means we don't really have to persevere through terrible games like Daggerdale, as there's always something else to play instead. Playing D&D Daggerdale for all its faults did remind me of a time when I didn't really have that kind of choice. When whatever game you decided to buy with your birthday money or rented for the week was what you were stuck with and you had to find enjoyment in it. There wasn't much to gleam from Daggerdale, but if nothing else, it made me appreciate just how well designed some of my favourite games in recent days are comparatively. Also, I got to shit on a piece of media for like 20 straight minutes, which is definitely a beloved pastime of mine. So I hope you enjoyed my little rant and the lighthearted nature of this video compared to my last few. I thought after such an in-depth look at a game franchise like Kane, something with a bit more levity might do as a palate cleanser. Next time, we're going to be exploring the wacky worldview of Tim Schafer as we discuss the brilliant cult classic Psychonauts and answer the question of whether games can truly be considered art. I mean, like, they can, but I'm going to, like, elaborate on it. It, it. Just turn on notifications and check back. It'll be great. Don't worry about it. As always, if you made it to the end of the video, then you have the true big dick energy. Thank you so much for watching and keep hacking away at that backlog.